Section 19 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 19. James K. Brady. I was born near Highland, Marion County, Ohio, September 23, 1846, and I lived on a farm until 1861, when my father and his entire family were taken sick with typhoid fever. My father died, and I lay seventy-eight days before I was able to leave my bed. In the fall of 1862, the day before I was sixteen, September 22nd, I enlisted in Company B, 64th Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry, and was in every battle with my regiment from that time on until the last battle of Franklin, Tennessee. In front of Atlanta, Georgia, I received a scalp wound in the back part of my head. At Franklin, Tennessee, I received a flesh wound in the right hip, and with five others of my company was taken prisoner November 30th, 1864. Marched the next day to Columbia, Tennessee, and after being held there a few days, we were marched with about 1,800 or 1,900 other prisoners to Corinth, Mississippi, where we were confined for a few days in a stockade. When we reached this we were in terrible condition, having marched several hundred miles over very bad roads in the winter season, with our clothing worn out and nothing much to eat, some barefooted, others sick. We were shipped from here to the place which the boys called Hell Upon Earth, the prison pen of Andersonville. On March 26, 1865, I, with several hundred others, was taken out of prison, and after a long journey, part of the way by rail and the rest on foot, we reached Big Black River and went in camp near Vicksburg, Mississippi. About the 23rd or 24th of April, I, with a lot of paroled prisoners, was loaded aboard the ill-fated steamer Sultana, at Vicksburg, Mississippi. Our condition on this boat was more like a lot of hogs than men. With the other passengers and crew, there were about 2,100 in all, besides a freight cargo, making in all more than double the carrying capacity of the boat. We were headed up the river for Cairo, Illinois. The boat landed at Memphis, Tennessee, on the evening of April 26th, where a part of the freight was unloaded. Sometime after we steamed up the river, making a landing to take on coal. My friend, David Edelman, and I went up to the hurricane deck and made our bed, as we were crowded too much below, and laid down. That was the last that I knew until the explosion, which occurred about two o'clock a.m., at which time I was suddenly awakened to my senses, as the fire was all over me, and my friend was trying to brush it off. It had already burned most of the hair off from the top of my head. We finally got the fire out, and began looking around for some means of saving ourselves, for we could see that the boat was on fire. We could see nothing to get, so we went to the front end of the hurricane deck, and took hold of some ropes, and went down to the bow of the boat, and, oh, what a sight met our gaze! There were some killed in the explosion lying in the bottom of the boat, being trampled upon, while some were crying and praying, many were cursing while others were singing. That sight I shall never forget. I often see it in my sleep, and wake with a start. After looking for something to save ourselves with in vain, we had about given ourselves up as lost, when all at once we saw a crowd with something which proved to be the gangplank. As this seemed to be our last chance, my friend and I both grabbed hold of it, just as it was going over the side of the boat, and we all went down together. I think not less than forty or fifty men had hold of that plank, at least there were as many as could crowd around it when it went into the water, and it was very heavy. I ran beside it. 
it struck the water end first and i thought it would never stop going down but it finally did and slowly arose to the surface i think there were about fifteen or sixteen of us that had stuck to the plank but now a new danger had seized me as someone grabbed me by the right foot and it seemed as though it was in a vice try as i would i could not shake him off i gripped the plank with all the strength that i had and then i got my left foot between his hand and my foot and while holding on to the plank with both hands i pried him loose with my left foot he taking my sock along with him but he is welcome to the sock he sank out of sight and i saw him no more by this time the plank had been turned over and we lost some more of our passengers i looked back and saw that there were two men on the plank behind me how many were in front of me at this time i could not tell but i knew that my friend was there as every little while he would call out some encouraging word to me to keep up my spirits the two men on the plank behind me would crawl up on top of it and finally upset it again and one of them lost his grip and went down to rise no more then the other fellow seemed to get crazy for he not only climbed upon the plank behind me but reached over and tried to grab me by the shoulder just as his fingers were touching my shoulder i dropped under the water and he went right over me into the river like a big frog turning the plank over with the force of his plunge but i came up on the other side of the plank grabbing it with my left hand i never saw that man again i was now getting very tired in my weak state as i only weighed ninety-six pounds when i came out of prison i weighed a hundred and fifty-four pounds the day before i was taken prisoner i was almost ready to give up when i heard my friend edelman say now boys this plank is able to carry fifteen or twenty men if properly handled and there are but five or six of us now i will steady the plank while the rest of you get on and lie flat then i will get on we all got on and laid flat down and paddled with our hands it was not long after this that one of the men in front said that he could see a house and for us to paddle on the left side we did as we were told and soon had our plank alongside of the building which proved to be a log stable with an old set of harness hanging up in it the stable was standing on the levee of the river but as the river was all overflowed there was not much of the stable out of the water when it got light enough to count up we found there were twenty-three of us on the stable and as far as the eye could see upon every old snag and every little piece of drift big enough you would see a man that sight i never will forget i can see it now as i pen these lines a little after daylight a man swam out about three rods above us and got on some drift the sight i hope i may never see again for he was scalded almost to pieces and he said boys it is going to kill me and he laid down and died i don't think he lived three minutes after he got out of the water then there was a nice large mule swam out to us just after daylight he had a piece of railing twelve or fourteen feet long tied to his halter strap one of the boys got down and unfastened it what became of the mule i do not know as he was there in the water the last i saw of him with just his back neck and head out of the water a little after sunrise we could see the smoke of a steamer coming up the river and in due time she came up to where we were the steamer came as close as she dared to and sent out little boats to take us in i had now become so stiff that i could not move and my friend with some of the boat's crew carried me down into the little boat and took me over to the large one which proved to be the jenny lind there was a doctor on board 
and he gave us something to make us throw up the water, but I did not throw any up. They carried me in the cabin, and that was the last I knew until about four o'clock in the afternoon. When I awoke, there was one of the Sisters of Charity trying to pour a hot sling down my throat with a teaspoon, for I found that I was in a hospital at Memphis, Tennessee. After waking up, it was not long until I opened my mouth, and I think there was about a gallon of water ran out of it. I wanted to go out and see if the other boys were safe. They would not allow me to go, for they said I was too weak but the next afternoon they let me go, and I found three of my companions alive, some of them badly hurt. The other two were either drowned or killed in the explosion. The next day we took a steamer for Cairo, Illinois, arriving there just after dark. Most of the boys went to the barracks as they were afraid they would get left, but I, with a few others, stopped at the soldiers' home where we received the finest of treatment, a good supper, something we had not had for three long years, and a nice bed. It was not long before I was sound asleep, and I knew no more until I got a gentle shake from one of the attendants that awoke me, but at the same time he said don't be in any hurry, you have plenty of time. I got up feeling greatly refreshed, dressed and washed myself, and sat down to a breakfast that was good enough for a king. After breakfast, one of the men went to the train with us, getting there just five minutes before leaving time. Then we started for Mattoon, Illinois, arriving there about eleven o'clock, and oh, what a sight we witnessed! The platform at the depot was crowded, from one end to the other, with the citizens of Mattoon and surrounding country, with baskets filled to overflowing with everything you could think of to eat. As fast as a basket was empty, it was refilled, and after we had eaten all we could, it seemed as though the baskets hadn't been touched. Let me say that during my entire term of service, I never received such treatment as while in the state of Illinois. After we had finished eating, the citizens wanted us to go home with them and stay until evening, for we could not get a train before that time. In the afternoon, it was learned that we could not get away until one o'clock that night. The people of the town called a meeting in a new hotel, which was not completed inside yet. That evening, the local speakers of the town made several patriotic speeches to us, but what was the nicest thing of all, there were about forty ladies, dressed in red, white, and blue, that sang several patriotic songs. Among the rest they sang, Welcome home, dear brothers, and it seemed that we were. Ever since that time, I have had a warm place in my heart for the people of Mattoon and surrounding country, also for the people of Cairo, Illinois. But all things have an end, and so at one o'clock we started for Columbus, the capital of the great and glorious old state of Ohio. In due time we arrived. But oh, what a change! Instead of being treated like lords, as we were in Illinois, we were treated more like so many dogs than human beings. Myself and a few others could not endure this kind of treatment, so we took French leave and went home. In about two weeks I received notice to come to Columbus and get discharged. We were discharged by order of special telegram from the War Department, without any descriptive list. I came home and went around to see my friends and neighbors, but when I went around it seemed as though everybody was gone or dead. Being in so much company for three years, I became restless, packed my kit, and went to Missouri. It was a little more lively there, as every man I met had a large navy revolver strapped to him. It made no difference whether he was a banker, dry-goods man, or a farmer. It was all the same. 
the revolver was there. I remained there eighteen months, and was never treated better by any people anywhere, and I never carried a weapon of any kind. Then I came home, married, and went to farming. I didn't like that. Then I went into the timber business, getting out spiles and stave bolts. I finally quit that and went into the retail grocery business. I followed that for about nine years, but at the present time I am not doing much of anything. My post office address is Morrell, Ohio. End of section 19「Section twenty of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section twenty. Joseph Bringman. I was born in Mansfield, Ohio, on the sixteenth of April, eighteen forty one, enlisted in the service of the United States at Mansfield, Ohio, on the sixth of August, eighteen sixty two in Company D of the 102nd Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Was captured at Athens, Alabama, on the 24th of September, 1864, and confined in the prison at Cahaba, Alabama. When I went on the steamer Sultana at Vicksburg, I was sick and very weak, and all of my teeth seemed to be loose, the result of prison life. Sometime in the evening of the 26th of April, 1865, we stopped at Memphis, Tennessee to take on coal. After this was done, we started up the river, and I laid down outside of the balusters on the cabin floor, on the left side of the boat. I did not sleep very soundly, and my sleep was disturbed by dreams. I had kept on my clothing as it looked rainy. A rope was stretched some twelve or fifteen feet above the deck, running to the spar, with which I came in contact some way, as I afterwards found the marks of the rope on my body, which causes me to speak of it here. It appeared to me in my dream that I was walking leisurely on an incline or sloping hill, and when I reached the top there appeared to be a ledge or projecting rock overhanging a river. I seemed to step upon it so as to look down into the water, and just as I took the second step the rock seemed to burst with a report like the shot of a distant cannon. I felt pieces of rock striking my face and head, and I seemed to be hurled out into the river. The sensation was like striking the water with my side and shoulders and going under with a waving or oscillating motion. I came to the surface but was still not fully conscious, and started down again with apparently the same motion, but did not seem to go down so far. I became more conscious and began to strangle. I now found that it was not all a dream, and also that my clothing was an encumbrance, and at once divested myself of it. On coming to the surface of the water, I struck a scantling some four inches square, I seized it, and also managed to get some more floating debris, and by this means I was able to keep above the water. My thoughts were more collected now, and I could see men in the water near me, and also horses struggling in the water, and one horse came near capsizing my frail float. My impression was that the boat had capsized and thrown us off. I then asked some of those that were in the water what had happened to the boat. None of them knew. A moment later we saw a light, and then we knew that the boat was on fire, and in a very short time the flames lighted up the river all around. I shall never forget that terrible ordeal. The water was icy cold, and in every direction men were shivering and calling for help, while the water was carrying us swiftly down the stream. The boat did not follow, and the darkness prevented us from seeing each other. After floating some distance I heard Philip Horn, of Company I, telling some of the others how to work to get ashore. I called to him, and he asked who I was. I told him, and then he asked me what I had for a float. 
I answered, and he said that they had part of a floor and called to me to come and get on. I worked over to them and tried to get on, but their floor seemed to sink too much and I did not venture on. I told them that I would stick to my boards and scantling. Had just let loose of their floor when it struck something and turned over. I understood that several were drowned. Floating along I several times came near the shore, but each time the current drew me back toward the middle of the stream. I could see the buildings on the bank of the river at Memphis as I floated past and hallowed for help. The steamers along the wharf were ringing their bells and men were out in canoes, but I was on the opposite side of the river and was not noticed. I was so chilled that I was powerless and a kind of drowsiness came over me. I felt that I was going to sleep and I seemed as comfortable as if in a downy bed. I soon dropped to sleep, or to unconsciousness, with the music of the bells of the steamers ringing in my ears. The next I knew I was on a boat at the wharf or landing at Memphis, lying on a mattress, and several men were working over me trying to bring me to consciousness. The boat had picked me up with others, from eight to fourteen miles below where the explosion took place. I knew nothing about this except what I was told. I learned that our boat, the Sultana, had blown up. There were twelve of my company on board that boat, and only two of us escaped. I was taken from the boat and conveyed in a carriage to the hospital at Memphis, and on going up the stairway, I dropped down and was unconscious till the next day. My injuries were a fractured arm, three broken ribs, my face somewhat scalded, scarred, and bruised all over, and frozen to unconsciousness. I was at the hospital about four days when an order came to discharge all that were able to go home. I got up and walked around to show that I was able to go but I suffered terribly before I got very far. I was discharged at Camp Chase, Ohio, on the 20th of May, 1865, and was soon at home, but could not do any work until cold weather that fall, and I feel the effects of that exposure and shaking up to this day. My present occupation is farming. Post office address, Enon Valley, Pennsylvania. End of section 20. Section 21 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 21. A. C. Brown. I was born in Clermont County, Ohio, on the 24th of November, 1838 enlisted in the service of the United States on the 3rd of September, 1861, in Company I, 2nd Ohio Volunteer Infantry, and served in the 1st Brigade of 1st Division of the 14th Army Corps, Army of the Cumberland. While in command of my company at the Battle of Chickamauga, September 20, 1863, was taken prisoner, had already served over two years of active service was taken from the battlefield to Belle Isle, which is in the middle of the James River, opposite Richmond, Virginia, remained on the island but a short time, and was then transferred to Smith's Building, opposite Libby Prison, in Richmond. In this prison we had the best fare, while in the so-called Southern Confederacy. They gave us all the mule meat we could eat. The guards around this prison were not unlike those that were on duty at many others, always watching for an excuse to kill a yank, and, as many of the guards had never been to the front and were not likely to be sent there, as they were too cowardly to be trusted, their only chance to kill a yank was to take one of us that was unarmed and shut up in a building where the yank could not even get at him with his fist. It was only when they were sure that they were out of harm's way that they had the bravery to shoot one of us. Our boys had noticed that some of the guards wanted to immortalize their name by killing one of us, so we concluded to test their marksmanship. 
late at night when most of the boys were asleep we would raise the window and present the yank that was to be sacrificed in order that the guard who was exposed to the dews and nightfall might get a furlough and go home for his health this i believe was the order at all the prisons that if one of us was shot for breaking the rules the guard that did the shooting was furloughed as soon as the yank would appear at the window the boys would commence to tantalize the guard to get him to shoot bang would go the gun and the yank would fall back pierced by ball and buckshot we did not have much trouble to stop the blood as the supposed yank was a broomstick with a piece nailed across to represent arms clothed in blouse and cap so the name yank would immediately appear in the window and call in question the marksmanship of the guard of course such performances would alarm the rest of the guards and there would be detail made to double the guard for the rest of the night many instances of my prison life might be referred to which were similar to that after two months at richmond by which time they had to commence eating the mule meat themselves we were taken to danville virginia where they had the riot last fall and the darkies killed so many of the white people we were kept at danville the balance of the winter of eighteen sixty three and eighteen sixty four and in the spring of the latter year were taken to andersonville georgia where i was introduced to captain wirtz april eighteenth on our arrival here i told my comrades that we were in for the war this proved to be the fact i was kept here until the eighteenth of march eighteen sixty five which made my stay at Andersonville eleven months to a day, and a little over nineteen months a prisoner of war. The records at Washington show that over a hundred and eighty thousand of our soldiers were captured and imprisoned during the war, and only about twenty-five or thirty thousand are now supposed to be living. We left Andersonville on the 18th of March, 1865, destination unknown to us of course as it was on all occasions when we were being transported from one prison to another we were going to be exchanged we started south and finally after traveling by railroad river and on foot we came to big black river twelve or fifteen eight miles from vicksburg and were here paroled the conditions admitted of our sanitary commission feeding and clothing us but we were to remain under control of the confederate major until legally exchanged while here i was called upon by the agent of the southern express company at vicksburg who informed me that he had received a dispatch from the superintendent of the adams express company at cincinnati ohio requesting him to render me any assistance i required in cash or otherwise i requested that the agent would kindly return my thanks to those of my friends north who had so kindly remembered me and my sufferings and all the favor i asked was when we were to be sent north that cabin passage be procured for me it was while here in camp that word came of the assassination of our beloved president abraham lincoln our confederate major concluded that it was not a healthy place for him and deserted us so I am still on parole, having never been exchanged. A train was sent for us, and we were shipped to Vicksburg. When marching from the train to the wharf, and when near the boat, I saw my friend, the express agent, awaiting me on the cabin deck. I stepped on the ill-fated steamer and was introduced to the first clerk when I was informed that my fare was paid to Cairo. The express agent, after wishing me a safe trip, bade me good-bye and went uptown. It was now about eleven o'clock. I soon sat down to dinner. You can imagine the contrast between sitting down at a table filled with all the substantials and pastry in the finely furnished cabin of a steamer compared with the surroundings and fare at Andersonville after eating a very light meal of the plainest food on the table i helped myself to more than some would think proper under different circumstances 
and carried out to my comrades quite an armful of victuals. I found them going for the hard tack and Lincoln coffee with a relish. A happier crowd I never saw. We all felt that a few more hours would land us at home, where anxious friends were awaiting our return. Our names had already been forwarded by telegraph to the press north, and many hearts were made light by the prospect of meeting a son, a husband, brother, or sweetheart. It is well, my friends, that we cannot see into the future. Little did this happy throng know what awaited it, that in a few more hours some were to be roasted, yes, burned to death, while others would be struggling with the waves only to sink, to rise no more. Many the tears I have shed in remembrance of this doubly sad calamity. After my comrades had faced the leaden hail, had fallen into the hands of the enemy, passed through all the harrowing experiences of prison life, that they should meet such a fate when almost in the embrace of friends at home seemed doubly sad. We left Vicksburg in the evening after supper. The clerk and myself had quite a chat, and he seemed to take quite an interest in having me relate some of my prison experiences. I broke in on his questioning to find out how many there were on board the boat. The Sultana was one of the largest boats on the Mississippi River. The clerk replied that if we arrived safe at Cairo, it would be the greatest trip ever made on the western waters, as there were more people on board than were ever carried on one boat on the Mississippi River. He stated that there were 2,400 soldiers, 100 citizen passengers, and a crew of about 80, in all over 2,500. We arrived at Memphis, Tennessee at about 10 o'clock at night, April 26. I retired to my stateroom, and the last that I remember, they were taking on coal. I was wakeful and commenced to plan what I would do in case of an accident to the boat. There were so many passengers on board that there would be great excitement. I decided that in case of a fire I would get off the boat as soon as possible. I then went to sleep. I learned after the accident that it was about three o'clock in the morning of the 27th of April, 1865, in dark and misting rain, when about seven or eight miles above Memphis, and near the cluster of islands called the Hen and Chickens, that one of the boilers of the boat exploded, and the boat burned to the water's edge. The first I knew after going to sleep, I found myself laying on the opposite side of the cabin from my stateroom, about the middle of the boat. The steam was rushing up all about me, and the fire was starting. The boat from midway forward was all torn to fragments, and this was the part of the boat that was occupied by the boys. Back of me, the chandelier in the ladies' room was burning brightly. I got up and started to the rear of the boat through the ladies' cabin, past a lady who was putting a second set of life preservers on a little child. This was the only child on board. When I reached the railing at the rear of the boat, after assisting a lady to throw overboard her trunk, I laid off my heavy army shirt, that I might not be encumbered by its heavy weight in the water, and overboard I started. Before I reached the water, something was thrown over that hit me, and down I went under the water. As I came up, a drowning man caught me round the neck with a death grip, and under we went, the second time for me. As we sank, I strangled. I now passed through the same experience that only a drowning person or those about to drown undergo. In those few seconds of time, my whole life, from my childhood down to that terrible moment, passed before me like a panorama, with perfect distinctness. As we came to the surface, I freed myself from his deadly grasp and struck out for myself. I now took account of stock and found all I possessed of this world's goods was a string around each ankle. 
as i did not want to be weighed down with a garment that was afloat and fastened to the strings i swam with one hand at a time and with the other hand broke the strings when about three or four hundred yards away from the boat the whole heaven seemed to be lighted up by the conflagration hundreds of my comrades were fastened down by the timbers of the decks and had to burn while the water seemed to be one solid mass of human beings struggling with the waves the light and the screams at this time cannot be described out of twenty five hundred only about six hundred were rescued and about two hundred of the rescued died soon after from the injuries received at the time of the accident most all on board were from the middle and western states the adjutant general of the state of michigan in reporting for the last year of the war refers to the sultana explosion as being the greatest calamity of the war a great many michigan men were on board and lost i swam about four miles and came to an island covered with timber i climbed a tree and the water surrounding it was about ten feet deep now when i hear persons talking about being hard up i think of my conditions at that time up in a tree in the middle of the mississippi river a thousand miles from home not one cent to my name nor a pocket to put it in and to contrast my appearance then with my face scratched and swollen my weight about one hundred pounds with my appearance today reminds me of two irishmen who on meeting each thought he recognized an old acquaintance afterwards found they were mistaken and one said to the other you thought it was me and i thought it was you but be jabbers it is neither of us i was about to close and leave myself up a tree after remaining in the tree about four hours a boat came along and took me off was mustered out of the service on the sixth of may eighteen sixty five my present post office address is cannon city colorado end of section twenty one Section 22 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 22 Michael Brunner. I was born in Bavaria, Germany, on the 25th of January, 1841. I enlisted in the service of the United States in September, 1861, at Georgetown, Ohio as a private in company c of the fifty ninth regiment ohio volunteer infantry i was captured on the nineteenth of september eighteen sixty three at the battle of chickamauga tennessee confined two days at bell island then in a warehouse of royster and brothers in richmond virginia thence to danville prison number no. five from libby prison i with three other comrades escaped but was recaptured near the blue mountains virginia and taken back again to libby prison and thence transferred to andersonville georgia in eighteen sixty four in december escaped from the hospital at andersonville with two comrades joseph pritchett of ohio and alec simpson of indiana we were recaptured near bainbridge georgia near the florida line and returned to andersonville in sixteen days after escape remained in andersonville until march eighteen sixty five when i was taken to black river mississippi near vicksburg and paroled was placed on board the steamer sultana on the twenty fifth of april eighteen sixty five I was on the outside of the cabin deck near the stairway at the time of the explosion and jumped on a stage plank and remained on it until it broke down, crushing many prisoners under it. I then remained on the front part of the boat until she was nearly burned up and sinking when I got hold of a piece of plank which supported me until I floated ashore on the Arkansas side of the river 
where I was picked up by a skiff and conveyed over to Memphis by the steamer Bostonian. I was discharged from the service at Columbus, Ohio, on the 6th of May, 1865. My present occupation is that of a shoemaker. Post office address, Georgetown, Ohio. End of section 22《セクション23オフ・ロス・オブ・ザ・サルタナ・バイ・チェスター・ディ・ベリー。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 23 William Carver I enlisted in the service of the United States November 5, 1862, in Company B of the 3rd Tennessee Cavalry, to serve three years or during the war. Was captured at Sulphur Branch Trestle which is near Athens, Alabama, September 25, 1864, and from there was taken to Cahaba, Alabama, where I remained until the water had overflown the prison. Left Cahaba on the 6th and arrived at Vicksburg the 16th of March, 1865, where I remained until the 24th of April and boarded the steamer Sultana. On the morning of the 27th of April, 1865, between two and three o'clock the explosion took place i was asleep on the hurricane deck of the boat behind the wheelhouse the report partially awoke me and the next i heard were the cries of the terrified people which words are inadequate to express i remained on the boat as long as i could with safety then went to the lower deck and jumped overboard the drowning men grabbed me and held me under the water. As soon as I got clear, I came to the surface of the water and swam to the wheel of the boat. A comrade reached down and helped me upon it. I was very much exhausted and rested a while when I felt the wheel giving way. It broke loose and fell into the water and drew me under. I felt something strike my side. It was the iron rod in the wheel. I clung to it the best I could. When the flames came towards me, I buried myself in the water as long as I could. I was burned severely on the right side of my face and shoulder. In some way I got on board with a comrade, and we floated to a drift pile on the Arkansas side of the river. I had no clothing on and it was about daylight when we landed on the drift pile, and two men came out to us in an old dugout and took five of us to the Arkansas shore. After a time, the steamer Silver Spray came along, took us on board, and landed us at Memphis, Tennessee. I was placed in the hospital and well cared for, but my father was among the missing ones. We left Memphis on the 30th of April for Camp Chase, Columbus, Ohio, and from there to Nashville, Tennessee, where I was discharged from the service June 10th, 1865. End of section 23. Section 24 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 24. Abraham Castle. I was born in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, and lived there until I was seventeen years of age and then came to Ohio. Enlisted in the service of the United States at Findlay, Ohio, on the 19th of January, 1861, in Company B, 21st Regiment, Ohio Volunteer Infantry was captured at Kingston, Georgia, November 6, 1864, and taken to Cahaba, Alabama. At the time of the explosion, I swam about three miles and was rescued at 10 a.m., more dead than alive. Not able to work. Post office address, Macomb, Ohio. End of section 24. Section 25 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Section 25. Simeon D. Chelf. I was born in Green County, Kentucky, on the 17th of January, 1844. I enlisted in the service of the United States at Liberty, Kentucky, on the 23rd of July, 1862, as a private in Company G of the 6th Kentucky Cavalry. About the 1st of March, 1865, our regiment left Nashville, Tennessee, for East Point, Mississippi. After letting our horses rest a few days, we started on what was known as the Wilson Raid, we supposed for Mobile, Alabama. General Crookston, with the 1st Brigade, which consisted of the 4th Kentucky Mounted Infantry, 2nd Michigan Cavalry, 6th Kentucky Cavalry, and 8th Iowa Cavalry, was en route for Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and on the 31st encamped within 20 miles of Tuscaloosa. The next morning, by gray daylight, our pickets commenced firing. We were all soon mounted, and Company C and G of the 6th Kentucky Cavalry were detailed for rear guard. Our army marched down the road and was gone about one hour when the firing increased. Then it ceased for a few minutes. Our companies were in line ready to march when the rebels commenced firing on us again. We swung into line, and seeing so many blue coats, we hallowed to them to cease firing, which they did for a moment. Captain Paris and Lieutenant J. J. Serber ordered a charge, which was made expecting to regain our command, although we encountered a larger force of rebels. We charged through the line of battle, then into a brigade that was marching by fours. At the rear of this brigade was a barricade, or a fence, built across the road. There five of us stopped, and were firing down the columns of another brigade, and while there we had to surrender. The rebels took us back on the road about a mile, and then began to take such clothing from us as best suited them. Oh, well do I remember of a rebel who traded me a pair of shoes for a good pair of boots, and all the difference I got was, Set down, you yank, or I'll put my bayonet through you while I pull them boots off. Of course the persuasion caused the trade. They then started to take us to prison. While marching along, an old man came out to the road and said, I guess, damn you, you uns ain't out stealin' horses today like you uns were yesterday. S. H. Davenport looked at him and said, Yes, damn your old soul, you ain't hid in the woods like you were yesterday. They marched us afoot until late in the night, and not a bite to eat until the second of April, about ten o'clock, and that was dry corn dodgers. We got to Uniontown, Alabama, the fourth of April, and while there some twenty or thirty of the first Mississippi cavalry came in. They wanted to know what kind of guns you damn Yanks got. We had Spencer carbines. I told them that we could wind them up and start them to shooting at sunrise, and they would not stop until sundown. Well, I believe it, for Ewan's kept a solid cloud of lead over our breastwork at Selma. From Uniontown we went to Moberly, Alabama, on Tom Bigby River. There we stopped for the night, and I asked permission to go and buy some sweet potatoes of some darkies. It was granted, and a guard, we called them our bodyguard, went with me. I got as many potatoes as I could carry for a five-dollar Confederate bill, and on my return to where the rest of the boys were, I saw a Confederate soldier peddling whiskey. I asked him how he sold it, and he said, Five dollars a glass. I told him I would take three glasses. I drank one, gave one to my messmate, and the other to my lieutenant. On the following morning we boarded a boat, crossed the river, and there the home guards were out, all of them, wanting to kill a yank. Then we started from there to Meridian, Mississippi, where they marched every one of us and marched us into prison. When the first two of our squad entered the prison, the old prisoners commenced yelling, "'Fresh fish!' 
After we all got in, they flocked around us to get the news from the outside world. Everyone was anxious to know what our army was doing. After we were in prison a while, we drew our rations, which were one pint of cornmeal, ground cob, and all together. This was one man's rations. And a half of a hog jowl for ten men per day, and also some pine wood, with which we did our cooking. After our fires were in full blast, one of the 7th Illinois Cavalry and I were talking. I said to him, I do not want to hurt your feelings, but a bodyguard is crawling on your neck. His reply was, It does not hurt my feelings at all. If the sun shines out, you will see plenty of them. There is no use of my telling it, for few will believe it. The sun shone bright next day, and you could see them crawling all over the prison, but lucky for us we did not remain there long. We were on the road to Vicksburg, Mississippi, to go into parole camp. We were there when Lincoln was assassinated, one of the best men that ever sat in the presidential chair, and if he was alive today, we, the rank and file, would be better treated by the law-making powers of the land. After we got into parole camp and had plenty to eat, we were happy once more. We boarded the ill-fated steamer Sultana, April 25, 1865, and at dusk she started out with her heavy freight from Memphis, Tennessee. The river was up to high water mark. I thought it was over high water mark when I came to try it. We landed at Memphis April 26, 1865, and unloaded some sugar, I don't know how much. We then pulled out a barge of coal and took on enough to run to Cairo, Illinois. Then we started up the river. Everything seemed to be safe. About two o'clock in the morning of April the 27th, the boiler of the boat exploded. When this took place, I was sleeping on the bow of the boat with my head against one of the cable posts. Seth H. Davenport was at my left, and on his left was a man who was killed. A piece of iron glanced my head, and in the excitement I thought the rebels had fired a battery on us. My blankets were covered with ashes, cinders, and fragments of timber, and they were rather heavy to crawl from under. The front part of the cabin and the pilot house were blown to atoms, and the stairway damaged so that it could not be traveled. The boat was crowded with soldiers from boiler deck to hurricane deck. A man stood on the lower part of the stairway and hallooed, The boat is sinking! The men rushed to the bow of the boat and jumped overboard as fast as they could, tumbling into the river upon each other and going down into the deep by the hundreds. After the main rush was over, I had more room and could see what was going on. While gazing about, I saw the fire start up in the coal that lay near the furnace. I looked for a bucket so as to get water to put it out, but couldn't find any. I went to the bow of the boat to see what had become of the man that was killed. He was still there, but all of his clothing was torn off him by the men running over his body. I began to look for something to aid me in swimming. I found a board fourteen or sixteen feet long, and was watching my opportunity to jump off and to keep as far from anyone as I could, when A. M. Jacobs came to me and asked me to save his life. He said, "'You can swim, and I cannot.' I replied, "'I will help you all I can, but a man cannot do much in water.' He then asked me to give him my board for his pole, as he called it. It was a small post used in the framework of the cabin, and was four by six inches square at each end, and the rest was worked down. I did so. We both went to the bow of the boat to jump overboard, but there were too many men in the water, the water being covered with men's heads, all of them begging for something to be thrown to them on which they might escape. I believe I saw a hundred and fifty or two hundred men sink at once near the bow of the boat. The fire was now getting headway and sweeping everything with which it came in contact, and I knew I must take to the water. 
I looked around for the man that was killed, but he was gone. I suppose someone threw him overboard to keep him from being burned up. Jacobs and I walked to the edge of the boat and stopped and prayed, and at the Amen we both jumped overboard. Jacobs held to the board I gave him, and when I came to the surface of the water I told him to put one end of the board under his breast and hold it there with one hand, paddle with the other hand, and to kick with both feet. After he got started on his board, I told him to do the best he could, and I started for the Arkansas shore. The boat being now under heavy flames gave good light so I could see the timber. When I got about halfway between the burning steamer and the shore, a boat came down the river with bales of hay, which were dumped into the river. The waves overtaking me, I was strangled by their slapping me in the face. At length I got the run of them by diving through one and riding the next. When I was within three or four hundred yards from the timber, a young man came swimming up behind me and said, "'Ha, pard! Haven't you something I could rest my hand on until we get to the bushes?' I stopped and looked at him, and asked him if he had any clothes on. He said he had on his shirt. I told him to take it off and he could swim better. He did so, and I pushed my post back, and he put his hand on one end, I on the other, and we both got the step and landed in the bushes together. Thinking now of having a good rest, I took hold the tops of two bushes. Letting myself down full length and not finding bottom, I concluded that was no place to rest, and started out in the brush to find land. Coming to a leaning willow, I threw my left arm and foot over it to rest. I held about half of my body out of water, but I got chilly in that position, and again let down for bottom, but could not find it. I then pulled out for the shore, but was unable to find it after wandering around one or two hours. This is very much shorter than I thought it was at that time. I then started for the main part of the river, thinking some boat might pick me up, every now and then hallooing, "'Has anybody found land?' A man hallooed, "'Here's a good dry log you can get on.' I told him to keep up a noise so I could find him, it being then the darkest hour of the night, just before daybreak. We kept up a chat until I reached the log which had a limb about three feet long. I threw my arms over the limb, but I could not kick another lick. I could not have got on the log if he had not helped me. I placed my feet on the limb, and with my hands rubbed and hit myself on the breast. I got so blind I could not see. After that wore off, I could stand up. Then I jumped up and down to start the perspiration. After the dawn of day, mosquitoes came on us by the thousands. We had it pretty lively then, until we were taken on board of a vessel, the name of which I do not remember. We were landed at Memphis and taken to the soldiers' home. All the clothing I had was a rebel hat, calico shirt, and a pair of red flannel drawers. A. Rhodes and I slept on a newspaper so as to keep our clothes clean. We remained there eight or ten days. After we drew our clothing, we were put on a boat and started for Cairo, Illinois. There we stopped at the soldiers' rest, afterward boarded a train, and ran up to Mattoon, where the citizens had provided plenty for us to eat. From there we went to Terre Haute, Indiana, where we were treated well by the citizens. From Terre Haute to Indianapolis, where we received a good supply of bacon and beans. Our next stopping place was Columbus, Ohio, where we stopped overnight in Todd Barracks, and the following morning started for Camp Chase, where we were discharged from the service. While walking up the street, we met a man who had a boiled shirt, and he asked A. Rhodes, "'What regiment is this?' He answered, "'No regiment at all. Just a detail of Wilson's cavalry sent down the Mississippi River to catch alligators.' 
My present occupation is farming. Post office address, Lebanon, Kansas. End of section 25section twenty six of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section twenty six william a christine i was born in worcester ohio september twenty third eighteen forty one and enlisted in the service of the united states at the same place august sixth eighteen sixty two in company h one hundred and second ohio volunteer infantry was captured at athens alabama twenty fourth of september eighteen sixty four and confined in the cahaba alabama prison at the time the sultana exploded i was sleeping with my comrades on the hurricane deck i looked around but saw nothing of them so i went down into the cook room and found a barrel with one end out and threw it overboard, and then jumped after it. But got into a crowd, so I let it go, and got on the wheel, and undressed, and again jumped. Something fell on me and burned my head. On looking back, I saw a plank floating toward me, and grabbed hold of it. A young man who had a plank divided with me, and then we started on our trip down the river. Soon after this we were joined by Comrade Elias Hines of the 18th Michigan. We noticed that the first man was not in his right mind, and on reaching one of those strong currents which carried us around, he fell off and I suppose was drowned. As he was about eight feet from either of us, we could not help him. We had all we could do to hold the planks together. We floated down the stream until daylight, when, on reaching Memphis, we were picked up by some of the fire department and taken up the stream about a mile, when we crossed over and landed below the city among some barges. I received a blouse from Comrade Hines and a pair of pants from someone on the wharf, then went to the hospital and got cleaned up. The 102nd Ohio Volunteer Infantry had 105 men on the boat, and only 32 were saved. Out of the 14 men in Company H, only 3 were saved. Occupation, Railway Mail Business. Post Office Address, 319 East Spring Street, Columbus, Ohio. End of Section 26 Section 27 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 27. F. A. Clapsaddle. I was born near Unionville, Columbus County, Ohio, July 28, 1842, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Alliance, Ohio, August ninth, 1862, in Company F, 115th Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Was captured at Blockhouse No. 1, Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad, December 4, 1863, and confined in the Meridian, Mississippi, and Andersonville, Georgia, prisons. The night of the explosion being a warm night, I took off all my clothes but my shirt and drawers before lying down. I was on the hurricane deck, near the bell frame, fast asleep, when the explosion took place. Something fell and struck the frame, covering me so that I could not get out at first, but by hard pulling I crawled out under the rods or braces of it. The deck appeared to be deserted, I could not see anyone. I threw a blanket over my shoulders and jumped to the cabin deck and from there to the lower deck. I will ever remember the terrible scene I witnessed there. I got a small board, went to the west end of the boat, near the wheel, and commending myself to take care of him who ruleth all things, I jumped into the water. I went down deep and strangled badly, but being a good swimmer did not get excited. 
my greatest fear was that i would get into the jam and someone would get hold of me and pull me down under i was within talking distance of but one person while swimming i picked up two short pieces of boards while in the water and laid one across the other under my breast so that i kept above water without much trouble i became very cold and my limbs began to cramp after a while seeing a light i headed for it and when i reached the place some men threw a rope out to me i let my little bark go and grabbed hold of it and about daylight they pulled me ashore i was very badly chilled there were fifteen of my company on the boat and eight were lost occupation farming post office address marlboro stark county ohio End of section 27section 28 of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section 28 george a clarkson i was born in england april 8 1835 i enlisted in captain mott's company b first michigan lancers august 5 1861 and mustered out of the service with regiment march twenty first eighteen sixty two re-enlisted as a corporal in company h captain purdy fifth michigan cavalry august eighteenth eighteen sixty two at milford michigan at the battle of trevilian station virginia june eleventh eighteen sixty four was taken prisoner with eighteen of my company was taken to richmond virginia first to the pemberton building there stripped and searched for money then to libby prison and from there to andersonville our sufferings on the cars for the want of food and water were great left andersonville for millen october thirty first and afterward sent to savannah blackshear and thomasville on the twentieth of december eighteen sixty four we were started on foot for albany a killing march on the frozen ground barefooted and nearly naked and on december twenty fifth were again placed in andersonville where we remained until march twenty fifth eighteen sixty five we afterwards crossed the black river to the neutral ground in rear of vicksburg mississippi on the first of april having taken an oath at jackson mississippi not to leave until duly exchanged do not know whether i was exchanged or not i left there for home april twenty fifth on the steamer sultana i was suffering with diarrhea and scurvy and a short time before the explosion was to the rear of the boat the men lay so thick that i could not see any of the deck all was peace and no sign of disaster i spoke to the engineer of how nicely we were going and then returned to my place on the deck which was about twelve or fifteen feet forward of the boilers next to the guard or railing of the boat being chilly i wrapped my blanket around me thereby saving myself from the scalding water when the boiler exploded william brown of my company lay next to me and was lost also one of company m of the fifth regiment who was next to him all of those around me were scalded i remained on the boat until the fire drove the most of us off to the bow of the boat into the water i threw a barrel into the river but someone got it men were thick in the river i jumped as far as i could but someone caught hold of my feet and i kicked him off i was very weak but an expert swimmer I secured a small piece of board about four inches by three feet which someone threw into the river. I had taken off all my clothes except my drawers and vest. In the latter was a diary and pictures of my wife and girls. These I saved. I did not try to swim but floated about four miles heading for the bank of the river. Getting into a clump of four or five small cottonwood trees I managed to get most of them bent down 
and stood on them up to my waist in the water. Once in a while, losing my hold, I would get a ducking. I was on the Arkansas side of the river, and the land was so overflown there was no getting to hard ground. I was rescued by the gunboat Pocahontas at 9 a.m., and was so used up that I had to be lifted into the yawl by the sailors. Some ladies were on the gunboat who gave us shirts and drawers. It looked at the landing at Memphis as though all the vehicles in town were there to take us to the hospital, etc. I was taken to the Washington Hospital, and after getting some new clothes was sent to Camp Chase, Ohio, and from there I received a furlough, by order of the Secretary of War, and went home. I was mustered out of the service July 5, 1865, at Detroit, Michigan. Since that time I have resided at Milford, Oakland County, Michigan, and am completely broken down so that I have to live on my pension. I was a sash and door maker in factories. End of section 28「Section 29 of Loss of the Sultana » by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 29. George M. Klinger. I was born at Chester, now Maysville, Kentucky, August 4, 1844. Enlisted at Camp Kenton, Kentucky, in the service of the United States, October 13, 1861, as a corporal in Company E, 16th Kentucky Infantry. Was captured November 30, 1864, at Spring Hill, Tennessee, near Franklin, Tennessee, and taken to Cahaba, Alabama, and was confined until the water rose to four feet deep in the prison. Not one foot of dry ground was seen for six days. A steamer arrived from Selma, loaded with artillery from Mobile. She was ordered to halt at the prison, where we waded out and crawled on to the deck. We started down the Alabama River to Mobile as we were told, but on account of the heavy fighting we had to turn back. We then went up the Tom Bigby River to Gainesville, where we were taken off and marched to Big Black River, back of Vicksburg, Mississippi, where we camped on neutral ground until the 24th of April, 1865. We received orders to pack up, which occupation did not take long, for there was not much to pack. We were put on board the steamer Sultana while they were patching the boiler, and I heard the captain of the boat tell the quartermaster not to put any more on, as we had a load already. We were driven on like so many hogs until every foot of standing room was occupied. We proceeded up the big Mississippi. As you all know, the river was out of the banks, and the levees were all overflowed. We stopped at a town called Helena in Arkansas, where a photograph was taken of our steamer with about 2,300 souls on board. We arrived at Memphis, Tennessee on the evening of the 26th of April, where we unloaded some hogsheads of sugar and other freight, and about one o'clock in the morning of the 27th, we left the coal bins on our journey home, as we were told. All were in good spirits to think of going home to see loved ones. Some of us had not seen either for more than two years. About two or half-past two o'clock in the morning, the awful explosion took place. I was sleeping with Comrade Willison of my company, next to the wheelhouse, aft the boat on the Tennessee side. The wheelhouse broke loose, and I came near going down with it. That was the last I ever saw of Comrade Willison. As nearly all were trying to get to the Tennessee side, I did not see any chance to be saved there, so I went to the Arkansas side and jumped overboard and started away from the burning boat with George Proper, I think, and had swam until we got sight of the trees when I came across a small window shutter. I had not gone far when a man near me called for help, for he was drowning. I shoved the shutter to him, 
and by this means his life was saved. He was picked up with me by the steamer Silver Spray. He was a captain, I believe, and belonged to the 2nd Michigan Cavalry. He made me give him my name, company, regiment, and place of residence, and said he would visit me, as I was the means of saving his life. That is the last I saw or heard of him. We were taken back to Memphis, Tennessee, where we were treated very kindly by the ladies of the Sanitary Commission who gave us underclothing so as to cover our nakedness. After remaining there a few days, we went on board a steamer bound for Cairo, Illinois. From there we went to Camp Chase, Ohio, thence to Louisville, Kentucky, where we were discharged from the service on the 17th day of June, 1865, under General Order No. 77, Current Series, by Captain Charles Fletcher, 1st United States Infantry. I am now a brick mason and contractor. Post office address, Maysville, Kentucky. End of section 29「Section thirty of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section thirty. J. S. Cook. I was born in Ireland, February fifteenth, eighteen forty two, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Cleveland, Ohio, in Company C, one hundred and fifteenth Regiment, Ohio Voluntary Infantry. August twentieth, 1864. Was captured near Franklin, Tennessee, December fifth, 1864, and confined in the Andersonville prison. On the 24th of April, 1865, I, with 2,400 other prisoners of war, was put on board the steamer Sultana at Vicksburg, Mississippi, on the Mississippi River, bound for Cairo, Illinois, and from thence to our several homes as the war was over. Most of us died more than a dozen living deaths while in prison, and looked more like candidates for the boneyard than for anything else. Nevertheless, when we heard the news that we were going home and back to God's country, we felt light-hearted and merry as we thought of seeing our girls again. While General Bangs walked down the gangway, the boys following him saw the old flag floating from the jackstaff. They cried for joy and hugged each other like schoolgirls. But alas, our joy was of short duration. We arrived at Memphis, Tennessee on the evening of the 26th of April, left there the same night, and steamed up the river. When about eight miles above Memphis, one of the boilers exploded while most all on board were sleeping. What a scene of consternation! I pray God to never let me witness anything like it again. Men lying in all imaginable shapes, some crying, some praying, many who, perhaps, never prayed before for God to help them until it was too late, some with legs broken or arms smashed, and some scalded and mangled in all ways. Those who were not disabled seemed to be at a loss to know what to do. Many of them stuck to the burning boat until the flames drove them off, and they went down in squads to rise no more. After the survivors were picked up and placed in the hospital at Memphis, there were only six hundred, half of whom were nearly dead. Many of these were picked off the tops of trees as the river had overflown its banks so that it was ten miles wide. I, with my bunkmate, J. C. Coke, was lying close to the bell on the hurricane deck. The smokestack fell on the other side, which crushed it down on the next deck below, and buried us up under a lot of boards, so that I thought for some time I could not extricate myself. When I got on to my feet, Coke spoke to me, and I answered him, and seeing what was the matter, I turned around to get a board to take with me to be of use in the water. I looked around for Coke, but could not see him, and never have since. This was the saddest part of my experience, 
as he was the only son of his father, and I had something to do with his enlisting. It so affected the old man and grieved him that he died partially insane some years after. Now my choice was between drowning and burning to death. I chose the former and scrambled to the edge of the boat and jumped overboard into the icy cold water. I could not swim very much and floated down the stream about as fast as the boat so that I could see everything that was going on. In my voyage I came in contact with a large log floating downstream and got upon it, but found that the log wanted to be on top of the water only half of the time, so I gave up that ship and clung to the little board until almost on the verge of despair. The scenes of my life were passing through my mind, and I was about to give up all hope when I saw downstream a dim light. This gave me new courage. As it approached me, I saw that it was a steamer, and as she neared me I shouted with all the strength of a drowning man for help. When they heard me, they stopped and threw me a rope, by which I was helped on board. After I was placed in the cabin of the boat, a Union lady, whose name I have often wished I knew, took off my wet clothing, put a dry suit of Uncle Sam's clothes on me, got me up to the stove, and made me drink two horns of whiskey, about fifteen minutes apart. This is the only time that I felt that whiskey did me any good. These kind actions were performed as a mother would perform a duty for her child. I love to think of that woman, and if I knew her whereabouts, I would make her a visit. End of section 30、section 31 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 31. William Crisp. I was born in England, January 1834, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Hillsdale, Michigan, August 1862, in Company D, 18th Regiment, Michigan Volunteers was captured at Athens, Alabama, September 24, 1864, and confined in the Castle Morgan, Cahaba, Alabama, prison. I was put on board the Sultana at Vicksburg. The boiler exploded when about seven miles above Memphis. I was badly burned and lost the use of one arm, swam three miles and a half, and got in a tree. I was rescued at 7 a.m. April 28th, 27th, 1865. Occupation Farming. Post Office Address, Silver Creek, Nebraska. End of Section 31. Section 32 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 32. Ben C. Davis. I was born in Bredgen, Glamorganshire, South Wales, on the 12th of May, 1827. Enlisted in Company L, 7th Kentucky Cavalry. Was taken prisoner at Lafayette, Georgia, on the 23rd day of June, 1864, under Colonel Watkins's command and taken to Cahaba, Alabama, and remained there until about November 1864. Was then removed to Meridian, Mississippi. Stayed there about four or five weeks, when I was taken back to Cahaba, Alabama, and remained there until about March 20, 1865, when the Alabama River overflowed the country, rising about two feet all over the prison. We had to do our cooking on rafts, and a great many men were sleeping on them. During the high water a steamboat came up the river and took about six hundred of the prisoners away, they being sent to parole camp at Vicksburg. When the boat came in sight there was a great rush for it. Everybody wanted to get out of prison. 
there was a sick sergeant that belonged to my regiment his name was morris Malayley. he was not able to travel through the water to the boat and i undertook to carry him through when i got to the stage plank the boat had let loose and we had to go back to the prison we remained there three days when another boat came and i had to carry the sick man again but this time we caught the boat and were taken to the parole camp in about three weeks the sultana came to vicksburg and took nearly twenty three hundred on board to go to camp chase ohio a little above memphis the boat stopped to get coal and when everything was ready they started up the river about two o'clock in the morning i got up to have a smoke i went to the boilers to get a light for my pipe and going back to the hurricane deck where i had been sleeping i sat down for about ten minutes when i got through with my smoke i got a canteen of water and was about to take a drink when the boiler exploded and the canteen flew out of my hand i never saw it again morris Mullaley and myself from covington kentucky john andorf and joe moss from cincinnati were sleeping under the same blankets and when the explosion took place i thought the boat had all gone to pieces in the confusion there was no command whatever i remained on the boat until the side wheel was burned clear to the water by this time it was getting too hot for me and i let myself down to the lower deck by a rope there were so many people in the water you could almost walk over their heads the fire was sweeping through the boat so that i could not bear to stay there longer i got a shutter about three feet square and at this time i found joe moss he begged me to let him have the shutter as he could not swim i threw it into the river and i told him to follow it which he did i never saw him again i pulled off all my clothes except my shirt and jumped into the river making toward the arkansas shore i knew i had a good journey before me but got there all the same when i reached the arkansas willows i could not find a safe place so swam about forty or fifty yards down here i found a large log fast in the willows so i mounted it i could hear so much groaning that i hollered to them to encourage them telling them i was on shore one man who was pretty close to me asked me what regiment i belonged to i told him to the seventh kentucky cavalry and he said here's a fourth michigan after you they kept on coming till there were five of us on the log i always did believe that i was the first to land on the arkansas shore that morning about half past three o'clock a m between eight and nine o'clock a man in a canoe came and picked us up taking us down to a plantation right opposite where the hulk of the sultana was tied up there i met john andorf one of my bunkmates i guess everyone that was on the sultana knew something about the monstrous alligator that was on the boat it was nine and one-half feet long while the boat was burning the alligator troubled me almost as much as the fire my post office address is covington kentucky end of section thirty two Section 33 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 33. John Davis. Was born near Ottawa, Putnam County, Ohio, October 26, 1840. When about one year old, was moved to Ayersville, Defiance County, Ohio, which has been his home till the present. He enlisted July 30th, 1862, in Company D, 100th Regiment, Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Took part in the battles of Rocky Face Ridge, Resaca, Dallas, Utoy Creek, Atlanta, Columbia, and Franklin. Was slightly wounded at the Battle of Resaca, and was captured at the Battle of Franklin, 
on November 30th, 1864. Was confined at first at Meridian, Mississippi, but was soon removed to Andersonville, Georgia, and finally taken from there and placed on neutral ground in the rear of Vicksburg, Mississippi, till sent forth with other exchanged prisoners on the ill-fated steamer Sultana. At the time of the explosion was sleeping on boiler deck within fifteen or twenty feet of the stern door. Had as bunkmates A. W. King, William Wheeler, George Hill, and James A. Fleming. The last named was lost, as well as Valmore Lambert, who was on cabin deck over the boilers. After the explosion he reached the stern door in a rather suffocating condition, but was not much injured by the explosion, and remained upon the boat until driven off by the flames. The river was very high and the water icy cold. Was in the water at least two or three hours, but was finally picked up by a boat sent to the rescue. When taken into the boat, could not stand alone and was perfectly prostrated. Was put to bed in the cabin of the boat and carried to Memphis. Remaining in Memphis two or three days, was then sent by steamer to Cairo, Illinois, thence by rail to Columbus, Ohio, and there discharged by special telegraphic order from the War Department. Post office address is Ayersville, Ohio. End of section 33section thirty four of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section thirty four l a dearman i was born august eleventh eighteen thirty seven i enlisted in the service of the united states on the first of february eighteen sixty four at nashville tennessee in company k of the third regiment of tennessee cavalry i remained at nashville until the eighteenth of june eighteen sixty four then started for athens alabama and arrived at that point on the twentieth of june eighteen sixty four as well as i can remember at the present time we went into camp and remained there until the twenty fifth of september eighteen sixty four when i was captured at the battle of sulphur branch trestle which is six miles above Athens. Cahaba was the next point. It was an awful one, too, when I arrived there, but I must come back to the night before I arrived at Cahaba. One of my friends and I made our escape by jumping from a flat car about 10 o'clock p.m. at a place about 10 miles above Selma, Alabama, in the swamps, the darkest and lonesomest place that I ever saw. We stopped close by the place where we leaped from the car until morning, then we started out, wading the water that was in the swamp. The water kept growing deeper and deeper until it compelled us to change our course, and we soon arrived at a large farm. It being cloudy and foggy, we soon lost our course and traveled around at random about one hour. The sun shone out, and we found that we had been lost. We stopped to rest until night, but in a short time our rest was disturbed by the barking of dogs and hollering of men. They soon came upon us. There were five dogs and two men. We surrendered, of course, as we had nothing by which we could defend ourselves. We were then carried to Selma, Alabama, and from there to Cahaba Prison, arriving there about the 1st of October, 1864. I remained there until the 6th of March, 1865, but my friend made his escape from the prison before this, and succeeded in reaching Nashville, Tennessee. I was taken on board a boat bound for Vicksburg, Mississippi, on the 6th of March, 1865, arriving there about the 18th or 19th of March, 1865. To the best of my recollection, I remained there until about the 24th or 25th of April. From Vicksburg I went aboard the great steamer Sultana. 
late in the evening she pulled out and landed at memphis tennessee to unload sugar leaving there the evening of the twenty sixth or morning of the twenty seventh of april as i had been up all of the previous night and had not had any rest or sleep two or three of the boys and myself went halfway back on the deck and made us a good bed out of our blankets and went to bed like white people as we had not done for some time prior i never knew when the boat left memphis nor did i know anything until about three o'clock next morning when the noise of the explosion awoke me from my dreams the first thing i knew i was standing on my feet looking listening and thinking what in the world is the matter now i soon found out what was the matter i turned and looked and saw one of the smokestacks lying in front of me i saw at once that it was torn to fragments and such screaming and yelling was never heard by this time nearly everybody was in the water swimming for life i saw that i would soon have something to do one of my messmates that went to bed with me that night came up to me with a board which was one and one half inches by ten inches and eight feet long and said lewis i can't swim a lick do you think this will be of any good i replied yes and picked up a short board about three feet long and said to him come on i will help you all i can i jumped into the water holding on to my board and told frank to put his board in and i will hold on to it until you get on you stay on one end of the board and kick with your feet and don't let anyone get on with you if you can help it he did so i gave him a start and got him out from among the crowd he made it all right and was the first man i saw the next morning with whom i was acquainted i went on and on swimming for my life on my short board it seemed to me that i was in the water about an hour and a half while i was in the water i struck an old log one end of it was hanging to something and the other end was floating about in the water i caught hold of the end of it and pulled myself upon the log and here remained until eight o'clock in the morning i could hear the boys all up and down the river banks on logs bushes and drift smacking and rubbing themselves to keep warm and crowing like chickens while many a poor boy was sinking or floating in the deep waters of the mississippi oh this was so unexpected to that crew that night we were carried back to memphis and remained there ten days and then we took a boat and started for cairo illinois and from thence to camp chase ohio we remained at this place a few days and from here went to nashville tennessee where we remained until the tenth of june eighteen sixty five when i was discharged i was a farmer when i enlisted in the service and am still trying to farm i live in st clair alabama near steele's depot on the a g s railroad end of section thirty four Section 35 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 35. J. W. Dunsmore. I enlisted in the service of the United States at Iona, Iona County, Michigan, December 25, 1863, in Company I, 1st Regiment Michigan Engineers and Mechanics and joined the regiment at bridgeport tennessee was captured at a small place called ackworth august eighth eighteen sixty four and taken to the cahaba prison in march i was taken to vicksburg and put on board the sultana her boiler exploded when about ten miles above memphis at the time h c aldrich and myself were lying on one of the upper decks near the starboard wheelhouse he said, What shall I do? I cannot swim. I replied, You have got to. I got two blinds for him from a window, and he went overboard. 
I followed him as quickly as possible. While I was swimming for dear life, a man called to me and asked for a chew of tobacco. I started to swim for the timber and was caught in an eddy and nearly drowned. When I got out of it I could see the lights of Memphis, but could not reach the dock, and finally was pulled out by a colored girl at Fort Pickens. Was sent from there to Camp Chase, Ohio, and was given a furlough. I was discharged at Detroit, June 1865. Occupation, farming. Post office address, Harrison, Clare County, Michigan. End of section 35.